Hello, I'm Kate McLaughlin, Professor of English Literature at the University of Oxford, and I'm here today with the painter and printmaker Tom Hammock, excitingly, in his studio in Bermondsey in London. These conversations that we're having form part of a series called Silence Painting Poetry um, under the auspices of the Humanities Cultural Programme funded by the Oxford Research Centre for the Humanities. So from 2020 to 2022, Tom Hammock is Glyndebourne Opera's Artist in Residence. And so we've given this conversation the title of Silence, Image, Music, Story. And we're hoping to explore the connections between and the interstices among all those things. So if we start, um, Tom, can I just ask you to describe in a general way how you see your art interacting with the music and stories of the operas. Sure, thank you. Um, I think it might be easier if I draw it. Okay. So, I mean, in one sense, it's a bit like a Venn diagram. Okay, so here you've got, here you've got story. Okay, and then here you've got music. And here you've got my picks. Okay? Yeah. So in that, in that sense, um, you want to try and combine everything in the middle here. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a given with opera. You've got music and a story. Mm -hmm. And then I do this crazy thing where I've been asked to make images that are inspired by the stories and the music. Mm -hmm. The connection between the music and my pictures is a little bit more tenuous. I mean, there's definitely a connection between the libretto which conjures up a narrative. Yes. And my pictures. Yes. And perhaps the connection between the music and my paintings is, it's just a bit more vague in one sense. It's very touchy-feely and it's very in my tummy. So this dotted line, I think, is at the heart of our conversation. This is what we're interested in. We're interested in the fact that music obviously plays to the ears. It sounds quite basically and your pictures are speaking with another language and this is a kind of silent language but not necessarily because I think as we're going to find out colour has its own language and its own noise um, but that sort of feeling in the tummy that sort of sense of a strong relationship that can't be put into words is exactly what we're trying to talk about ironically and paradoxically. So one of the operas that Glyndebourne was putting on uh, this season was the um, was Mozart's Die Entführung aus dem Serai, or the abduction from the Seraglio. Unfortunately, the production was cancelled because of the pandemic, but um, we do fortunately have Tom's images for it. And this opera um, is about the attempts of the hero Belmonte to rescue his fiancée Constanza from a Turkish harem. Um, now, this opera is an example of a Zingspiel, which means mixing music with spoken words. Um, and it is, in fact, the opera about which the Emperor Joseph II said it contained too many notes. So there's already an issue about too much noise versus what is enough noise or um, maybe no noise at all. The role of silence in storytelling. So the first picture we're going to look at of Tom's is Constanza at the window, which is this glorious image of Constanza looking out, uh, hoping that Belmonte is going to come and rescue her. She's looking out to sea. She's at the window and there's the most gorgeous William Morris-esque wallpaper around the window with birds and flowers. It's just really beautiful. You can really feel the texture. And she's looking out to sea and then far in the distance there's a gorgeous pink and gold sky. Um, so, Tom, I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about the making of the picture and in particular the sense of space and, if you like, silence that appears far in the distance. I was very drawn to doing a diptych for this opera because I suppose at root you've got a paradox where Constanza is incarcerated by the Pasha mm -hmm. 
but she's being very well looked after. Mm -hmm. And at one point, there's a, a scene where he uh, wants to go to bed with her, and she rebuffs him, and he behaves himself. And I think I was very interested in the idea of perhaps Belmonte not being the great man in her life. Mm -hmm. You know, perhaps if she goes back to him, to Spain, she's going to be one of his chattels. Mm -hmm. And I thought in this age, it would be interesting to look at this story in that light. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. So she is, of course, looking out to sea from her gilded cage. And the sea... Uh, and in the and in the sea is a dow with him lickety spit, coming to rescue her. Looking quite shark like the sound. Very shark like. I thought. I'm glad you picked that up. Meanwhile, I suppose I try and use sort of symbolism in pictures quite a lot. This is perhaps a bit clunky, but uh, we found a William Morris wallpaper with these pomegranates in Greek mythology and Roman mythology, I think. You know, they're associated with both fecundity and with chastity, I think, peculiarly, and with sort of steadfastness. We took on Morris and we literally copied it and made it by hand. We inked up, we literally inked up a piece of wood in a flat colour. Mm -hmm. And um, we placed that over the top mm -hmm. and passed it through the press later once we'd actually printed up all the image so you get everything slightly underneath it. Mm. I wanted it to be like a ghost or shadow and we'd spoken about this before I think. I'm very interested in the whole idea of uh, this romantic tradition of rock and figure where you experience a landscape through a figure looking at that landscape so you almost put yourself into her place. Quite Caspar David Friedrich. Very much so. Looking and also into the fog. Exactly and lots of contemporary artists use this um, Someone yeah. like Catherine Bradford or uh, and Andrew Cranston, even Kiefer. And so when she's looking out to the sky there, to the distant horizon, it's not necessarily that the boat, the Tao, is what's bringing her freedom, but there's a freedom beyond that. She, I mean, her choices are limited at the moment, and you can sort of tell this by how circumscribed she is. She's in a frame. But out there, there's something ineffable. That it seems like true freedom, which she probably can't reach because her choices are where she is or in the boat. I think that's, that's exactly what it is. I mean, don't you think if you were prison, imprisoned, I mean, if one could have a window, at least you can dream in a way. Mm -hmm. And... Um, What's awful about Fidelio is you, you have Florestan incarcerated in a dungeon where he can't even see any light. And I think that, I think that this long horizon gives her the opportunity mm. to dream and to contemplate and be very quiet and silent to look out. And I think you've really captured the gorgeousness and sadness of solitude. I mean, there are many aspects to solitude, and as you say, solitary confinement can be horrific but here there's a gorgeousness about it and a sort of well an ineffable hope as well so this is the other half of the diptych and this is constance's rescue so she's on her way home now um and she's now in the boat and in the middle of a, a sort of midnight blue sea with an even darker sky so could you say something about the thinking behind this image and I'm always interested in the in the spaces in your in your paintings, where the boat is going and what its trajectory might be. She's with her maidservant mm -hmm. and her maidservant's partner. They're flying away from the harem, and I've made the harem a bit like a sort of crown, and it's in the distance, in the dusk, radiating light, all the lights on, and perhaps she's looking back on it with some sadness. Because it looks quite inviting, actually. It's very inviting. And it's, of course, it's got this beautiful view out to sea. The Tao is a bit like a shark, like we, mm -hmm. and it's stealing into night. Mm -hmm. And um, it's almost like a vehicle, isn't it? It is. Sliding through the water. The water is, is stunning, I must say. And even when it's in its blackest, you can see um, the detail in it. Yes, there's a sadness to this freedom, freedom in inverted commas, and although it looks very inviting over there because there's lovely sort of orange kind of glitter on the sea, um, there's a great sense of going into the unknown. I mean, in the sense she's going back to the known because she's going back home. 
But what is she really letting herself in for? Yeah, and I, I think this is perhaps when one gets to a certain age, like I am, I'm nearly 60, and you realise it's about so much of life, you know. Be careful what you wish for sometimes. And I think the grass sometimes seems greener on the other side, and it's, it's not. And this is something we'll come back to with Lunar Voyage as well, where the protagonist has very much this feeling. Just on this picture, I love the kind of wake of the Tao. It seems to be cutting through the water, well, this, like, this shark-like fin. Um, it's a brilliant evocation of a kind of silent movement. The sea is quite still, not completely still, but there's this sense of it. It's almost like a stealth machine going through the water. Oh, that's lovely you say. I wanted that very much. And I think... Um, you can feel it cutting through the water and you can mm. actually hear that, you know, that sort of noise of the ripples through. And I, and I wanted to sort of create this phosphorescence at night um, to also add to the, to the forward momentum of the boat. And as I'm sure we'll talk about, movement is often associated with noise and silence with stillness. And I think you're managing to get, you're managing to get both in here. Thank you. So another Mozart opera in the Glyndebourne Festival um, is Cosi Fan Tutte, um, which was composed in 1789 with a libretto by Lorenzo da Ponte. And this is a comic opera. Um, the title means Thus Do All Women or All Women Do This, um, based on basically fiancé swapping. So two men each try to seduce the other's fiancé to prove their faithfulness with, as you can imagine, um, comic consequences. The picture that, of Tom's that we're looking at is called, brilliantly, All Men Are the Same, which is a kind of play on the opera's title, so Cosi Fan Tutti as opposed to Tutte. So Tom, I wondered if you could, you could talk to us about this large space between the two couples. I mean, from what I understand about pictorial composition, it's fairly unusual to have a space like this. Yes, you sort of stretched, stretched the picture plane out. Right. So first of all, you've got this very simple arrangement of figure and ground. Mm -hmm. In the opera, it's a horrible opera in lots of ways. And I think as a, as a woman or, I, uh, or as a man feeling uncomfortable at what's going on here, the music's sublime, but it's pretty rough. Yes, it's true. And because they're testing them very unfairly, mm -hmm. in it they sort of lose their friendship too. Mm -hmm. I wanted to create a composition of diagonals, really. Although I'm not creating diagonals in recessive space, it's in a very flat picture plane. In a sense, he's looking at her. Right. These two are going out initially. Yes. These two are going out initially. He's looking at her. Yeah. He's looking at her. Yeah. They're not really looking at each other. Yeah. She's looking at, you know, so it's, yes. it's quite fun. Playing, yes, playing this. it is. And there are, I, I noticed that in other of your images, you create this sort of space in terms of the line of sight. And so with those two looking at each other and those two, there's almost like a kind of square between them, which is a space. Um, a space, and we've just got silent looks here, haven't we? I'm always trying to bring this back to silence, but here's the silence, I suppose. But also here's the silence, because they're not saying anything to each other, and they're not saying anything to each other. But also I've, I've printed them up in very bright colours because the music is sublime. It is. And it crackles and twinkles and sparkles and, and lifts your heart, and it's effervescent, really. Totally. Totally. And you completely get that with these glorious colours here. I mean, I, it, I mean, it is very hard to describe, but what, what colour would you call this? I mean, I would call it a sort of gorgeous deep peach. Almost salmon peach, yes. Salmon peach. And then going into a sort of mauvey purple. Gorgeous, gorgeous. And then gorgeous. you've got underneath, you've got this delicious citrus lemony yellow uh, with a bit of chrome in here. Yes. And then you've got, then, then you do this weird thing here, which is pretty counterintuitive, right? you have this cool colour, this sort of rather uh, a spearmint or peppermint um, green going into an emerald, but with a zip of uh, a lovely kind of permanent green underneath. 
gorgeous. Yes. And then you've got a tiny zip of purple along the top on, on, on the horizon line going into this uh, sort of slightly magentary Prussian all on yes. top of a pink. Yes. So what we really tried to do is we really tried to layer the colours so they're almost uh, like looking at a coloured MRI scan, you know, all these colours all over the place. Interesting. So there's different sort of layers, as it were, sort of top to bottom. And then there are layers, sort of vertical layers in terms of the costumes. And then there are layers. Going yeah, from left so to right or right absolutely. to left. Yeah, I can't, don't know quite to explain. But I mean, you're kind of taking colours this way and that way. Yeah. And, and then you're pulling them apart. And then you're flattening everything out with flat colour on top. Yeah. Yeah, and it creates a wonderful sense of a, of a group, but a group with tension. This might be the ultimate it's pic difficult. picturing of awkward silence, which is one of my favourite silences. Awkward or silence, silence. And, and, and I hope pain. Yeah. You know, this is not fun, no. especially for the women. It is all the way through, they're in turmoil and tumult, and it's a, it's a nightmare. And the men are kind of laughing all the way through. So another opera that Gleinborn put on this season um, is Fidelio by Beethoven um, with the libretto by Joseph Sonnleitner. Um, and in Fidelio, this is Beethoven's only opera, and um, the female protagonist, who's called Leonora, um, disguised as a prison guard, rescues her lover Floristan from death in a political prison. And Tom, we're looking at um, a picture now which is called Underworld and Escape. And Leonora is appearing variously, I think it's seven times, is it, in this picture? Mm -hmm. um, and I wondered if you could say something about the difference or the contrast between the brutality of what I assume is the prison and these gorgeous, tr lush trees that are surrounding it. I mean, the backstory, I suppose, um, sort of GCSE level backstory, as far as I was concerned, was, was that Beethoven, you know, had a, had a, had a thing for Napoleon. And then he realised the error of his ways. And he then, when he wrote Fidelio, it's this extraordinary opera about hope and the way love can conquer evil. And he, and the music is sublime. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very abstract opera, actually. I wanted to set the political prison as a sort of modernist box, glass box, a bit like sort of, you know, the MI5 building or whatever on, on the Thames or, yes. or even, and here actually we've looked at Corbusier's Villa Savoie, uh, drew out a, a flat schematic of it. And we have Fidelio, who is Leonora in disguise, although I've, dra I've drawn her as a woman rather than a man, going down, down, down into the dungeon. So she starts up on this rather nice walkway, mm -hmm. going down like a 60s building and then goes all the way down. And to answer your question, I really wanted the forest that this place is set in to link to romanticism and the romantic movement and mm. a world that we need to get back to, mm. or at least to live in unison with. So it's, it's contrasted a lot. You've got the hard edges and the glass and the steel and the concrete. Yeah. And then you've got this forest which is sort of in a cycle of growing and dying. These are dead trees and trunks, and but they're all part of the ecology. Yeah. Um, and so there's a sort of idea of a life cycle going on here. But in here, the life cycle stopped. And you can see here Floristan down in the dungeon. This is a rather Blake in image, actually, it seems to me, of Floristan. Both Blake and, that? definitely, and, and Leonardo. Yes. So I, I wanted him, and I think in the opera he's naked and he's chained up. Yeah. And yeah. often you see in productions I've seen, he's often chained, there's sort of chains going up in, into the dungeon. Is it too simplistic to say all this, all the prison is enlightenment, it's reason, it's, it's what, what all that can lead to, 
and here is imagination and feeling. Very much so. That's that's a, a good call. I mean, I, I just I'd, I'd done this book, these pictures, this book with um, Adam Nicholson mm -hmm. about Coleridge and Wordsworth when they kind of really got going. Yes. In the Quantock, in seventeen eighty seven eight, and about around then. A bit later, I think. A bit later. Okay. Yeah. And um, before they went off to Germany, and then and and sort of the birth of of the great Romantic movement and and things being you know corporeal the connection to nature, yeah. almost sort of in a metaphysical way, in a quantum way. Yeah. And so I think that was going on in my head for sure. And I wanted to have a visual metaphor for what I thought was going on in, in Beethoven's opera. And you often see the sort of octagonal prison in sets. And of course, I'm very, very worried. I don't want to step on the designer's toes. Hmm. So I had to sort of go, uh, as I always try and do with these pictures, try and go out, out on my own. So we're now talking about an opera by Rossini, Il Turco in Italia, um, of 1814, libretto by Felice Romani. And this is a comic opera um, and it features a struggling writer, a Turkish prince, a bored wife, at least two jealous lovers, a masked ball, and a love triangle that's more like a love polyhedron, I would say. <laughs> I won't even attempt to, to um, describe the plot. And we're looking at what's really a diptych here by Tom, um, Fiorella's Lookout and Sail Away. So, Tom, you've written that um, Fiorella's Lookout, um, you made this woodcut to try to convey a sort of personal grief and silence connected to the loneliness of the two female protagonists, Fiorella and Zaida in Il Turco in Italia. So this scene is a solitary one, if we concentrate on the left-hand side to begin with. Fiorella's looking out to sea, so it's another woman looking out to sea, waiting to be rescued. Well, actually, in this case, she's, she's looking out to sea for her um, Turkish prince. But you mentioned silence, you mentioned grief and silence, and I wonder what other elements you think contributes to that sense of silence, grief-stricken silence? Well, I think one thing is um, the composition. Mm -hmm. when, when, when one goes to the sea and you look out to the horizon, it's, it's often a very contemplative moment, isn't it, or place? Yes, yes. It's where we are at our most contemplative, I think. Mm -hmm. And you've got the horizon line, so you're often looking out to it, and it has a sense of yearning, mm -hmm. that space. You know, late, those late Rothko paintings where... They're almost like landscapes, have that feeling. And um, this is very much based on a print and a painting by Munch. Okay. I mean, the composition pretty much stolen directly from him, who's a great hero of mine. And um, the maiden looking out. And of course, actually in his, you've got the maiden next to death, um, crouched like a sort of toad next to her. But I, I've taken that part of the composition out. And here there's an empty landscape or an empty seascape apart from this one figure. Mm. And there's also quite a prominent moon, which is another feature of your art, I think, the interest in the moon. And of course the moon's uninhabited, so the, the silence and the grief, I think, is also to do with great solitude, the idea of places that are uninhabited, the great stretch of water and then, the, and then space above it, the skies. I think that's right. And, uh, you know, the moon's only reflected light and... So the light, the passion, the heat is coming from elsewhere and reflected on it. And, and, and mm. she's yearning for that. Mm, mm. And it's not there, it's cool. And so what do we make of her, the reddishness of her head and neck and hair? Well, I, mean, I, wanted, sort of louder well, I wanted that to be almost like her beating heart, her passion. Okay. Yeah. You know, the, her desire. Yeah. But actually it's not going... It's inside her and it's, it's there, it's all, all, all there to come out. But at the moment she's, she's trapped almost as if she was on the moon. So the way you've picked those, that out in her, in the, in the oranges and in her dress, suggests that that sort of passion is thrilling through her. You know, she's sort of enraptured in, in a sense. Um, and it's a brilliant contrast with the coolness of the, the greens of that, that promontory of yeah. land. And the greyishness of waiting, the sort of greyishness yeah. of just... Yeah, when is he coming? When is he coming? It's almost like the colour in a f colour film has been taken, taken out of the image. Yeah. Well, let's put the let's put the images back together so we can see them together again. So um, 
This image is called Sail Away, and um, what's happening is that this is Fiorella, this is Zaida and Selim, and they are sailing back to Turkey, and the opera has um, magically resolved to everybody's satisfaction, and the chorus is singing, May heaven serenely smile on you, may the winds for you be fair. Mm. Um, but there are cool tones in this picture, as there are in, in this one, and I wondered what it might be silently saying. I mean, we talked about with um, Constanza, um, going back to Spain, the idea of, well, what lies ahead for Zaida? And yeah, and what she's leaving. I, I think, I think um, sometimes I don't look too much into it. Sometimes the coolness has to work because if it was too hot, it wouldn't have worked with the rest of the image. Mm -hmm. So uh, I wanted the whole image to be pretty cool. The only mm -hmm. thing that has a tiny bit of heat in it is her hair. Yes. But they're almost interchangeable, these images, in the sense that this could act as for both women, mm -hmm. this figure, mm -hmm. for the moment, they're happy. We don't know how long that's going to last. They're still far apart in the boat. Maybe they have to be. Perhaps she's his muse. She's almost like a figurehead of the boat. Is she looking forward or backwards? I think she's definitely looking forward. Okay. Off they go. He's actually the one who's looking backwards. Yeah. It's quite fun playing these games. Yeah. But I do. it is silent. It is quiet. It is. Stealing into night again. Absolutely. And again, that sense of the... the um, you're using the cooler colours, the lighter colours for the wake. Although the boat is in motion, there is this sense of silence, kind of stealthy moving through the water. I mm. know, yeah, it's stunning. I like that kind of shape. Of that. It's a, a gaff-rigged cutter. So you've got this prow that's almost vertical going down into the water. It's just a beautiful shape. You can imagine it sailing beautifully and being rather comfy. Mm. 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 Yeah. So we're now talking about um, Leos Janacek's opera, Katya Kabanova, um, from 1921, librette by A.N. Ostrovsky, um, uh, based on Ostrovsky's play, The Storm. Um, and uh, Katya is a, is a tragic opera with a female protagonist trapped in a marriage with a drunken boar, um, not to mention an aggravating mother-in-law. Oh, a nightmare um, mother-in-law. A nightmare mother-in-law. <laughs> So in the second act, um, while her husband's away, um, she and Boris Grigoryevich um, embrace in the garden. And this is what we're seeing in, in Tom's um, picture here, which is called Catcher's Kiss. And this act, although it's one just while it happens, leaves her absolutely plagued with guilt. When did Tom, if you could just start by telling us about this incredible multicoloured swathe that's surrounding these lovers in the garden? Well, as, as you've indicated, it's this opera... It's heavy bananas. <laughs> it's, it's really, it's dark. And it's, it's about this small town on the edge mm. of the River Volga. And it's very bourgeois. And she's trapped. Mm. And everyone's looking from behind their neck curtains at what everyone else is doing. Yes. And it's stultifying. And her stepmother is a nightmare and um, very controlling. And she has this tiny glimpse of this deliciousness with Boris at the end of the garden the walled garden which is on the boundary of of a great river so I wanted it to be almost like at the front of a ship through the gate where this loveliness happens and you know for god's sake they're only having a kiss and, <laughs> having a kiss and and I wanted the uh <laughs> the, the wall to just like be fizzing that is quite a kiss. I mean, if it's, it's if, a big if, it, kiss. if it feels like that, yeah, it's quite a kiss. Yeah. <laughs> yes. and of course, she just you know in the end she drowns herself, yes. and, and it's horrendous. And often, uh, the company, all the players in the opera, kind of look at the audience, and you know, as a way of saying you're you're a couple in this. You know, this is this is holding a mirror up onto society, and they literally turn and look at you. Yeah. So she drowns herself in this blue. Mm. She drowns herself in the river that runs by the uh, Kabanov house. So, I mean, we're, we're laughing and about this, this gorgeous feeling here. But here's death, so close. Well, I kind of feel that there's no way out for her. So, um, as you implied by the chap, who was it who wrote the short story called The Storm? Oh, Ostrovsky. Yeah. yeah. So Ostrovsky, and it is a storm, and there is this extraordinary storm, and this comes out in the music as well. But rather than really be a killjoy and, and have everything grey and stormy, I thought 
it would be quite nice to try and allude to her death as a way out for her, mm. for mm. of peace, mm. because she's 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 built a different stuff and she's not really going to ta- be able to tame herself, and the only way out, unless she can escape with Boris, who suddenly retracts, yes, is is to is is to die. Yeah, it's a bit yeah. like. Constanza looking out the window at the horizon line, really. It's always these deep blues that the women in the pictures are yearning for, it seems, looking out to these gorgeous sort of colours on the horizon. Is it just... As they want to perhaps, merge with them. Well, perhaps if there were men, there would be blues as well. I mean, blue, blue is the colour of space and depth of field. Yeah. And, and, you know, when you're on the motorway and you're being chased by a police car, it's the blue light you see for miles and miles and miles. You know, it's that kind of... Yeah. thing that goes on forever, isn't it? And it's... it's. Yeah. I mean, different people I've talked to have different colours when you say, what colour do you think silence is? And for me, it's a very deep blue. Me I think too. of this as a kind of silent realm over here. Me too, very much so. So The Rake's Progress is an opera by Igor Stravinsky from 1951, um, libretto by W.H. Uh, Auden and Chester Coleman. Um, and the opera arose when Stravinsky saw a series of etchings, eight etchings by um, William Hogarth, The Rake's Progress famously, um, at an exhibition in Chicago in um, 1947. Um, So basically the male protagonist, the main protagonist, um, Tom Rakewell, um, deserts and true love, they have these um, very um, obviously obviously symbolic names, um, to experience the delights of London in in the company of a character called Nick Shadow. And Nick Shadow turns out to be the devil. um, And it all ends rather unhappily. Um, I think I can say that much. Um, And what we're looking at here is an amazing um, picture by Tom called um, Guide Me, O Moon, and True Love and the Rake. And we can see here the Rake and and True Love. So, Tom, it's an extraordinary picture. The level of detail is amazing, and maybe you'll tell us about that, particularly on the Rake's coat and on Anne's dress. We've got a thing that is not a yellow brick road, but a blue brick road. We've got a gorgeous peachy moon. We've got this extraordinary sort of texture like wood. Um, we've got the lighted windows up in the far right. So can you tell me what the what you're responding to in the storyline with this colour palette? I really went for this. Hogarth's a big hero of mine and I love the piece. I didn't want to step on David Hockney's footsteps because he did this extraordinary set in the f- 70s, mm-hmm. which keeps coming out at Glyndebourne, of cross hatching, and it's very flat, and all the uh, sets are really almost like just just flat pieces of card. I too love the narratives in *The Prince* by Hogarth, uh, and the story is even more exciting than than your brilliant analysis of it because. He's a spendthrift. His father's a miser. He's a spendthrift. He inherits all this money, and he goes. He goes for it. You know, he he's like the prodigal son, and 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 he he's on a mission. He marries Anne True Love, and loves him, and he marries her because he really sees that she's got a wonderful diary and lovely London house that she's going to inherit, which is this Queen Anne has here. Mm. By this time in my picture, she knows that he's a lost cause. And she's singing Under the Moon. And she's really, it's a beautiful aria. Mm. I think it's the end of Act Two. And she sings this beautiful aria. It's very sad. And she says, look, I know what's going on here, but I still love him. I've tried to combine the rake with the devil. Mm -hmm. So um, you've got his kind of invisibility cloak. Mm -hmm. And with details of the, the sort of nastiest bits of, I think, four series of Hogar's etchings, not only The Rake's Progress, but Marriage Alla Mode, Gin Alley, and a couple of others. Harlot's Progress. And then she's got details of uh, some of the prints on her dress, of all the sort of fancy, um, nice, pretty things of the dresses. And then he's got, you know, some pretty grim things going on. You know, you've got little devils and dogs mm. and mm. pokers up people's bottoms and mm. so on and so forth. I set them in a kind of pole darky and, you know, clothing sort of around sort of 1760 and um, I love his boots yeah she's got rather nice silver boots on mm-hmm. and um, it was incredibly difficult to make and fun 
really, really fun to make and get the registration right. Mm -hmm. So I'm again, I'm interested in the lines of sight, and we talked a bit um, about this when we looked at All Men Are the Same. It's the, you've yeah. got the moon there. It seems that he's facing the moon, but she's also looking at the moon, and so it creates a kind of space between them. They're not looking at each other. They're looking at the same object, but from different angles. So the rake has his back to us. She's, uh, we see her from the side. But nevertheless, even though this is the centre of the picture is very occupied, there's a sense of space as well. Is, is that a fair comment? Do you I think, think that's good. I mean, I wanted this to be like opening up Pandora's box or all the furies coming out of the yeah. box and all the screaming noises coming out. And this is his... Yeah. Dark heart, you know, he's up to no good and he loves gambling and eating and whoring. And and it's uh, brilliant that he wears all that on his coat. And he wears it on his coat. She can see it. She's looking at him. She's actually looking at him, I feel, not the moon. And he's looking away. Okay. He's looking out, out, out of sort of stage left. And she's looking at him almost into, his, into the side of his face, into mm. his ear. Mm. So she sees him as who she is, but she can't help going back for more. You know, she, yeah. he goes to, to Bedlam and, you know, the Maudsley or Beth, Betham and, yes. and he, he's kind of gone mad and she's still feeding him and then she goes mad at the end. It's completely tragic. So there's this connection between them or at least this connection. I mean, he obviously has got his, if he's not directly looking at it, he's got his eye on her house. He would like to have that nice Queen Anne house. He probably will get it. He gets it. Um, and she, she's looking at him, this connection there. Um, and he, even though he's got his back to us, is this gloriously extravagant creature. I mean, you can sort of see why, you know, she, God, she's yeah. so attracted. He's, he's, he's I mean, great fun. All those, I mean, who wouldn't want those boots? And <laughs> I don't know what this is. It looks like somebody almost on a laptop or playing a yeah, forte piano play, or yeah, something. Yeah, exactly. Playing, yes. playing a little harpsichord or something. Yeah, exactly. And, and another one here. Yes. So he loved all these things. So here in one of um, the Rake's Progress, you've got a scene where he's in his house, I think it's about the third or fourth print, and he's got someone measuring up for a coat, and then there's a, a musician in the background. He's obviously, he's quite cultured too. He's, he's a spendthrift, but he's also, he spends money on composers making things, and people are creating suits. and yeah. So he's got all that going on as well. And then you've got someone in, you know, falling into the gutter, and then yeah. you've got him as the rake later on in Bedlam, kind of, Undressed, and this looks quite boshy. And that pink figure in the middle, that yeah, that's like and yeah, there are lots of things like that. And there's a sort of man with a cudgel beating a baby, and you know, it's pretty yeah. grim. And there's yeah, yeah. a dog out with yeah. pushing over a man on a chair, and so on and so forth. Yeah, it's amazingly dark and vivid, and she has this lightness to her. Um, she's heaven, I mean, she's an innocent, and the awful thing is, she, she goes at one point. She watches in church of him marrying an old, an old dame who's yes. got lots of money and she's watching and she's there with her baby. And then later on, you know, sh she's fainting away in, in the hospital as well. Yeah. It's yeah. tragic. Yeah. And music's brilliant. And um, Chester Carmen's, I think, libretto is, is wonderful. Great. Well, Tom, thank you so much for talking about this Glyndebourne series. They're absolutely revelatory. It's extraordinary and so diverse and yet so many connections between them. So thank you. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Thank you.